um, I want to I want to welcome everybody um, to uh, an event uh, that uh, uh, Ted Merwin, who's our guest speaker, who I'll introduce it properly in a few minutes there, and uh, Cassie uh, Shelton, uh, the executive director of OU Hillel and I, we uh, cooked this uh, plan up uh, more than a year ago, and we were hoping very much uh, to bring uh, uh, Dr. Merwin out uh, to speak uh, and to have the um, OU community and the Oklahoma City community and OU faculty and staff uh, all kind of get together at the Hillel and have, um, have pastrami sandwiches and then uh, listen um, to, to Dr. Merwin. I'm gonna go between Ted and Dr. Merwin. I've known him about 20 years and we're friends. So it's a little odd for me to keep saying it that way. Uh, but- um, Just call me uh, Ted. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll just cut, cut, cut to it and call you Ted. Okay, I, 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 again, we've been friends a long time. I'm sorry that uh, didn't work out just the way we planned. Uh, but thanks to Cassie and her elves, uh, our students and members of the Norman Jewish community have gotten their sandwiches. I realize now it was a little sadistic of me to do this with two days before Passover. I, if I had really looked at my uh, a calendar, uh, while well, uh, Jews around the world are busy getting rid of their 11 products uh, uh, one way or another, um, uh, <laughs> We're, we're delivering them, but uh, I, I think everyone, uh, everyone will forgive me. And, uh, you know, if you're, you're not from the very uh, religious corner of the Jewish world, as I am not, uh, that's, that's why God made hefty bags, um, uh, if, if you want to get rid of your chametz quickly, uh, it can be done. Uh, okay, uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, Cassie Shelton, my partner here from OU Hillel uh, for um, uh, putting this uh, evening together. I want to thank um, Roberta Clark, the uh, executive director of the Oklahoma City Jewish Federation, who helped us get um, some funding, which we uh, were going to uh, use to feed everyone, but at least we fed our students who, who need it most. I think hope everyone can appreciate that. And um, I want to thank Trice Hyman, who has now organized this talk twice, uh, and uh, but he's, uh, we've all gotten used to it in, uh, uh, as Trice puts it, the late Corona era. Uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, before I introduce uh, uh, Ted, I just want to um, let folks know, if you don't already, we have a couple of just lunches left in the uh, school year, uh, the first Wednesdays of every month. Uh, next uh, in April, the first Wednesday in April, Kat, uh, Lindsay Katzier um, from uh, Langston University is going to be speaking about Jewish characters in Charles Dickens, a uh, very interesting subject. And Lindsay is a very interesting speaker. Uh, so we're looking forward to her. And then uh, the first Wednesday in May, uh, uh, Ronnie Grinberg, uh, who is also a very interesting speaker, is going to be talking about Norman Podhoretz and Midge Dechter, uh, the uh, first couple of American neoconservatism. So we have a couple of more uh, events uh, this uh, academic year. And um, I think now we, we have uh, uh, pretty much everybody admitted. Uh, let me remind you, um, uh, if you are, uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, either hold it till the end or put it in the chat box. That way, I can read it out loud. Uh, people, if they can't see the chat box, I can read the. That way, I can read, see the question, and Ted will field it. Or you know, if you are there in face on the screen, uh, two dimensionally, you can stick up a hand or uh, uh, you know wave frantically. Uh, uh, if you're uh, otherwise, uh, you know, if you have, uh, if you're, if you're, if you're, uh, I see that uh, most people have already muted themselves. So I guess we're all, we all know this dance by now all too well. Uh, uh, that way phones going off or dogs uh, going crazy will not interrupt uh, Dr. Merwin's talk. So without, uh, without further ado, uh, it's a, a, a great pleasure uh, to introduce 
uh, Dr. Ted Merwin, who is the uh, author of two books, uh, first in their own image, New York Jews and Jazz Age Popular Culture, uh, which is itself a wonderful book, and uh, Pastrami on Rye, an overstuffed history of the Jewish delicatessen, which won a National Jewish Book Award in 2015. Many of us are nominated, few of us are winners, but uh, Ted, uh, Ted is. Uh, Ted was a freelance art critic from the New York Jewish Week from 2000 to 2019. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, HuffPost, Haaretz, Newsweek, and other major media outlets. Um, he served most recently as APAC's Synagogue Initiative Director for the Mid-Atlantic Region. He served for many years as Professor and OU Hillel Director at Dickinson College with great distinction. Uh, and uh, is currently researching the evolution of U.S.-Israel relationships through representations of the Jewish state in film, TV, photography, music, fashion, food, and other forms of pop culture, uh, a project for which I can't think of anyone better suited. So um, it's, my, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend, and uh, a really great scholar of American Jewry, uh, Dr. Ted Merwin, and I will meet myself. Thank you, Alan. That was such a nice introduction. And I'm so grateful to you for inviting me and to Cassie and to Trice for, uh, for making this possible. And, um, you know, I just wanna say that, you know, I value our friendship very much too. And, and uh, I think back with a lot of fondness to when uh, we invited you to Dickinson to uh, talk about your book on Joseph, and it was really a highlight of my career as a, as a Hillel director. Actually, that talk was basically organized by Sidney Harlow, who happens to be on this call, <laughs> my student engagement coordinator at the time. Um, Sidney, how did you get here and what are you doing here? Um, <laughs> it's good to see you. So uh, without, without further ado, let me see if I can share my my screen and if I can get the PowerPoint up and running. All right. Okay, so I hope everyone can see this um, very nice display of, of uh, foods from Katz's Delicatessen in New York. So I am a New Yorker born and bred in New York. And although I actually grew up not in a city, but in the suburbs, I grew up in a town called Great Neck, which is in Nassau County on Long Island. And uh, I grew up in a very secular Jewish family. So even though most of my friends were Jewish, it was very much a, a Jewish community. I actually knew very little about Judaism. I never went to Hebrew school. I didn't have a bar mitzvah when I was 13 years old. And, um, you know, I, I, I really didn't have much of a connection to the, you know, to the organized Jewish community. I did, however, have a very close relationship with my maternal grandparents, Jean and Lou Kaplan, who lived just across the border in New York City and in Queens. And I used to see them pretty much every weekend. Now, my grandparents were also not particularly religious, but they were very ethnically and culturally Jewish. So they really only ate what they would consider traditional Eastern European Jewish food. I don't think I ever saw them eat an egg roll or a slice of pizza in their entire lives. And they lived really long, you know, good lives. And so when they came to visit, we would have to get them food that they could eat. So there was a deli around the corner from our house. It was not a kosher deli, um, but it was very much a Jewish deli. And I was the one who was sent around the corner on Sunday nights to pick up the order for our family when my grandparents were visiting. And it was always the same order. It was a pound of turkey, a pound of roast beef, it was a dozen slices of seeded rye bread. It was a can of Heinz vegetarian baked beans and a small squat container of gravy. So the, in those days, this is something that the students on this call will not uh, remember or not have any uh, connection to. But um, it used to be when you went into a deli or even a butcher shop or something, the person behind the counter would put your order in a waxed white paper bag and they would actually total up the order with a black grease pencil on the on the outside of the bag and they would add up the order and they would tell you how much it was you would pay for it 
and I would take the, the bag of food. I would come back around the corner. I would come into my parents' house and my mother actually still lives there. My father passed away, but my mother still lives there. They're, they, you know, she has a small round kitchen table. I would put the food down on the table and I swear within five minutes, there was not a crumb. There was not a morsel. There was not the tiniest speck of food on that table. <laughs> and so what it makes me think of is, you know, we're gonna be celebrating Passover as Alan mentioned in a couple of nights. And one of the plagues that's visited upon the Egyptians is the plague of the locusts who come and kind of devour everything in sight. <laughs> and that was kind of like what it was. We were like the locusts, you know? Um, and, and that was really our connection to our Jewish identity was that those Sunday night deli dinners in Great Neck. And I was actually telling this story at one of my talks and somebody said, you know, it's so funny that story that you told because it's so ironic. And I said, well, what's ironic about it? And they said, well, you know, when, when Jews went to delis in New York and other places, they didn't traditionally eat the foods that you mentioned. I mean, certainly not really roast beef and certainly not really turkey, at least not in the old days. You know, you went to a deli because that's where you found pastrami and corned beef and tongue, which was actually really, I mean, my grandmother's favorite favorite thing to eat. I mean, when we, when we went out to a deli, she, nobody else in the family ate it, but she loved to order tongue, which my sister and I just could not understand how somebody could eat tongue. It was like, are you eating the tongue? Is the tongue eating you? We can never figure that one out. So, um, but what it made me think about when this person said that it was so ironic, what it made me realize is that we were already doing something Jewish in an Americanized way. Um, we had taken a sort of Jewish cultural ritual in a sense, and we had adapted it to our own kind of evolving American tastes. And what that made me realize, and it was very much reinforced when I started to do research, when I, when I, when I kind of decided to focus on, on the Jewish deli as a research topic after grad school, was that these foods really held a lot of symbolic meaning for American Jews coming from uh, you know, a situation of, of grinding poverty in Eastern Europe to a place of abundance, to a place where they could afford to eat, um, to, to, to buy and to eat um, you know, much greater quantities of beef than, than they ever had before. And so this is one of the themes that I want to explore with all of you tonight is, you know, not just kind of the history of the food itself. I mean, I'm actually not a foodie. I'm, I'm really not. You know, my, my work in this book is really using the delicatessen as a lens onto the American Jewish experience and, and really seeing the deli as, you know, a neighborhood institution, as a, as a gathering place for the Jewish community. So when I think about the delicatessen, it's not that I don't think about the food, but I think even more about the function that the delicatessen played in promoting Jewish community. And so that's gonna be a major focus of what, I'm, of what I'm talking about tonight. Okay, so, uh, so in, sort of in line with that, this is an image that for me sums up that concept of, this is Katz's, as you can see, and even though most of the people in the, in the image you know, are clearly employees of the deli, you also have the cop on the bead on the right-hand side. You have what looks like maybe the local gangster, uh, you know, two figures from the left. Um, you, know, <laughs> you sort of have the sense that this is where all these colorful characters kind of come together. And so when I started thinking about this, I realized that you know, every, immigrant group, ethnic group in America had its own characteristic place where they would kind of meet and greet. And so, you know, we think about the Irish having pubs and bars and things like that. We, we think about uh, the Italians had what were called social clubs where they would, uh, mostly Italian men would, would get together and play bocce and play cards and cook pasta and smoke cigarettes and things like that. Um, you know, African Americans had barbershops and beauty parlors, but for Jews, you know, I think the, the sort of communal gathering space par excellence was, was the Jewish deli. But what actually I think sums up this concept the most, and, and this will be familiar, I think, to all of you, 
is this very famous, perhaps the most famous sitcom theme in, in American television history. So I wanna play that and you'll recognize it right away. Sometimes you wanna go where everybody knows your name And they're always glad you came You wanna be where you can see Our troubles are all the same You wanna be where everybody knows your name Okay, so this is obviously from Cheers, which is about an Irish pub in Boston. And the person who wrote it is named, the musician is named Gary Portnoy. He wrote it with uh, Judy Hart Angelus. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, Gary Portnoy sounds Jewish, right? Maybe he was really thinking about Jewish delis when he was writing this song, whether consciously or not. So I tracked him down, you know, nowadays you can find ev everyone. And, uh, and I said to him, Gary, you know, like, you're Jewish, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, did you go to delis when you were young? And he said, yeah. He said, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn and then we moved to Long Island. And, you know, we used to all kind of pile into this family station wagon on Sunday nights and we'd drive into Manhattan and, and go to Cass's, you know? And he said, but the song wasn't about that. <laughs> and I said, I think it was. I mean, you know, I think maybe subconsciously it, it was. It was a reflection of your, of your experience as a Jew as much as it was about, uh, you know, what it was, what it was on the surface. All right, so uh, the other thing that really interests me or, or, or another thing that interests me is that the, the deli and the foods that the deli served really became iconic of, of New York City at a time when Jews represented a huge proportion of the population, you know, 20, 25% actually of the, of, of the entire population of New York in the, in the earlier part of the 20th century. And so you have delis that, um, and, and deli foods that really become very iconic. And so, you know, this is one of my favorite ads. It's from Look Magazine from 1970. And I think what's interesting about it is it poses a, an interesting question, which is, you know, sort of what is the real thing? What is the most authentic symbol of New York? Is it the, you know, cabbie leaning out the window of his cab while he's munching on the sandwich and, and drinking the soda? Is it the Coca-Cola, which it's an ad for? Or is it what's actually in the foreground, which is the corned beef sandwich on rye with the little pickle and the little radish on top and the mustard next to it. You know, I think it really, right? We think of New York as the big apple, but we don't really associate apples with New York these days. Um, and, and I think that we're much more likely to think of the overstuffed pastrami sandwich in connection with New York than we are with, with the big apple. They're both big, but you know, whatever. They also both have, interestingly enough, they both have a kind of erotic symbolism to them because, you know, Adam and Eve for the apple and the, uh, well, all right, the overstuffed uh, meat in the sandwich. I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll return to this theme, I promise soon. All right, um, <laughs> but you know, this is, a, this is another ad that I love from 2012 when New York was vying with London, Paris, Moscow, et cetera, to host the, um, the Summer Olympic Games and sort of suggests that the, again, overstuffed sandwich from the Carnegie Deli is, is not just the same weight, it's sort of worth its weight in gold, I guess you would say, right? Okay, and, and the other thing, of course, that's very interesting is that, uh, you know, I keep, using this word overstuffed, which is in the title of my book, but, you know, this whole notion of excess, of, you know, everything being kind of supersized, right? And New York has this place in which everything seems sort of comically cartoonish and blown out of proportion. And, and this becomes a very big part of Jewish culture in particular, um, where food becomes such a kind of central preoccupation of, of, of Jews as they become more upwardly mobile and can afford to eat more and can afford to go to the Catskills in the summer and gorge themselves uh, during their summer vacations and to come to Miami Beach and gorge themselves during their winter vacations. And so, you know, this is something that really becomes for better or for worse, you could probably say mostly for worse, a part of American culture writ large. I think there's a Jewish, I actually do think there's a Jewish element to, you know, to that, to this whole supersize concept. All right, let's take a step back and just talk for a moment about the history of the delicatessen. So delicatessen is a German word. And a lot of people, when they hear the word delicatessen, they think that it comes from the word Essen, which in German or Yiddish means to eat. It actually does not come from the word Essen. It comes originally, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, comes originally from the Latin word 
delicatus. And delicatus in Latin actually meant anything or anybody that or who was exciting, attractive, enticing, voluptuous, right? I mean, it actually did have a kind of erotic, uh, you know, possible shade of meaning to it. And it was only later that this notion of the delicacy as a, as a food, as a, you know, special food that's eaten in small quantities, you know, on special occasions, really develops in the capitals of Europe. And we have these specialty food stores that spring up and that cater to, again, a rising middle class that sort of exhibits its, you know, rising social status by the, the fancy imported gourmet foods that, it, that it's able to consume. And this is certainly true in Germany. Um, this is one of the famous delis from, uh, from Munich that dates back hundreds of years, I think from the 18th century. And uh, what it reminds me of actually, I've never been to Germany, but I've spent a lot of time in England. And if anyone's been to London and to the food hall and Harrods department store, I think it's in the basement of Harrods, then you might have a sense of, you know, what these, what these places were, were like. This like, huge cornucopia, the profusion of foods from, from all over the world. Okay, now, of course, when, uh, when Central Europeans, both Jewish and non-Jewish, start to come to the United States in the middle of the 19th century, they bring with them this concept. They are not rich, you know, they're for the most part poor immigrants, but they see that there is a demand for different kinds of foods among people who are living in the immigrant districts like the, the, lower, the lower East Side of New York. And you have German delicatessen stores that, that open up first. And eventually you have a, a like a kosher variant or, or version or adaptation of that, which also, um, which, which spring up as well. We don't actually know what the first Jewish delicatessen, uh, where it was or what it was. It may have been an outgrowth of the kosher sausage companies like Isaac Gellis that had been around since uh, the beginning of the 19th century. Actually, Isaac Gellis was one of the purveyors of food to the uh, troops during the Civil War in the North. Um, so it could have been an outgrowth of that. Could have been an outgrowth of a kosher butcher shop that started to sell some prepared foods on the side. We really don't know. All that we know is that there definitely were kosher delis that, and these were stores. They were always delicatessen stores. They were not restaurants, uh, at least not until after the turn of the century when they start to take in tables and to provide what we would consider to be, you know, the, you know, the experience of actually eating in a deli. This is from Philadelphia from uh, shortly before the First World War. And, uh, and you see um, sandwiches and hot frankfurters at all hours uh, also find lunchroom. It's a new thing. That's why they have to emphasize it. Uh, you know, a place where you can actually eat kosher food. Okay, now I just wanna emphasize though that one of the things that I assumed, and Alan can back me up on this, one of the things that uh, one realizes when one is doing academic research, just like I would guess, uh, just like we know scientific research, is that you often start out with a hypothesis that turns out to be wrong. <laughs> and you have to modify it and you have to kind of figure out what your next step is. So I started with the assumption that the delicatessen's heyday, I mean, I, I knew nothing. There would have been almost no research done on this. Nobody had looked at where the delicatessens were and you know how many of them there were and, and what decade they were at their height. Like the research just hadn't been done. So, so it was exciting to be sort of plowing new ground. But, uh, you know, I just start out with an incorrect assumption, which, it, which, which was that the deli was really at its height during the immigrant period on the Lower East Side, right? That, you know, just like the Irish came here and they were discriminated against. And so, you know, to some extent, I guess stereotypically, a lot of them turned to, to, to drinking, but that wasn't true either because they had, you know, a lot of them were used to, you know, alcohol being a part of their culture back in, back in Ireland. So, you know, for some reason I thought Jews came to the United States and, uh, you know, the one, one of the ways that they coped with the pain of dislocation, discrimination, you know, prejudice and so on was by, was by eating and by, they, they were homesick, they wanted a taste of home, you know, all that stuff, completely and totally wrong. Um, you know, there was a survey done in 1899 of the 10th ward of the Lower East Side, the political ward, uh, that's, you know, Essex Street, Hester Street, Delancey Street. I mean, the, really the Jewish heart of the Lower East Side at a time when there were probably 
more than 200,000 Jews who were living in that, you know, in that tiny, I mean, it was more crowded than Calcutta or Bombay. There were people who said it was the most crowded place on the face of the earth. There were 10 delis in 1899 in the 10th Ward. So either there were extremely long lines for Sunday brunch <laughs> or the deli just wasn't a big part of Jewish life. You know, it just wasn't. It existed, but not in any kind of great numbers. So then I really had an interesting puzzle or a question in front of me, which was, okay, so how did the delicatessen develop into, into an institution that was so central to Jewish life that it was almost like, at least from some of the jokes or some of the memories and things that people, that people you know, mentioned, it was like, you know, more important than life itself almost. I mean, it's like people said, you know, this is what, this is what, you know, if somebody's in the hospital, right? <laughs> and they just had a heart attack, right? <laughs> I mean, what do they want? What do they want you to smuggle to them? You know, they want a corned beef sandwich. You know, that's what they want. You know, like, even if it's going to be their last meal. I mean, actually, I was interviewing a deli owner in Boston and she whispered to me, she said, you know, people come here on respirators. They come here for the last taste of pastrami before they die. Can you, could you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I've never tried whispering out for Zoom before. Uh, turns out you can whisper on Zoom. Uh, you know, there was a deli in, in Montreal called uh, the Brown Derby, but it was, it was known as Heaven's Waiting Room. <laughs> it reminds me of, uh, if you remember Soupy Sales, who was a comedian who I grew up watching on, on TV on reruns in the 70s. You know, he had this great joke where he said, if I had my life to live over, he said, I'd live over a deli. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, oh, also I'll give you one more. There was, there's a wonderful passage in Jonathan Rosen's book, The Talmud and the Internet, in which he talks about his, his grandmother who was visiting her in the hospital, she was dying, whatever. And uh, he says, uh, the great German poet Goethe on his deathbed wished for more light. My grandmother wished for pastrami. <laughs> you know, so it's like, Okay, so how, you know, so when did the deli become so important, you know, in, in American Jewish life? Okay, so um, I'm gonna actually skip this. I'm gonna skip that. Um, so what I found was when Jews moved out of the Lower East Side, when they started to move like neighborhoods like this, this was taken in East Harlem in the 1920s. After the First World War, with the building of the Manhattan Bridge and the Williamsburg Bridge to Brooklyn, from the Lower East Side, uh, with the building of the IRT subway up to the Bronx, with the building of, uh, you know, with the new technology that was happening that enabled people to move around a lot more easily, Jews were moving to the outer boroughs. They were moving to Upper Manhattan. Here's another one of Upper Manhattan, a, a kind of fancier, fancier one. Uh, also East Harlem, 104th and Lexington. And, uh, and Jews were also starting to move some a little bit more into the mainstream of, of American society. They were becoming a little bit more upwardly mobile. And so the delicatessen actually, I mean, there were two types of delicatessens. Let me just say that at the, at, you know, at the, at, you know, at, at the outset, which is that there was the kosher deli, which was like this one, sort of the corner kosher deli, which was in many ways the cornerstone of the, of the ethnic neighborhood. I mean, it was where Jews really, um, you know, I mean, Sunday night, you know, just like for my family, I mean, Sunday night, going to the Jewish deli or taking food out from a Jewish deli, Sunday night was more important than, you know, in the deli than Friday night was in the synagogue. Because this was a generation, I mean, starting in the 20s, of Jews who were really starting to acculturate. I mean, they were, they were moving away very rapidly from keeping kosher, from going to synagogue. I mean, it was just this huge sort of movement towards a more secular kind of Jewish identity. So the Delhi becomes a kind of, what I call in my book, a kind of secular synagogue, a kind of, you know, new space for the articulation of, of American Jewish identity. And not only that, but I think a place where, you know, Jews who, who had come from all different countries, right? From Romania and from, you know, Poland and from Lithuania and from the Ukraine and so on, Right, and, and these, these differences used to be much more salient, you know, than certainly than they are today. And they were already starting to fade out a little bit, I think by the 1920s. I mean, I used to, you know, I used to go to synagogue um, when I first started getting involved in Judaism. I had my bar mitzvah actually when I was 20. And I'd started going to a synagogue during the summers when I was home from college. And, you know, at the, at the Kiddush, at the, like the uh, collation, I guess they call it, the refreshments after the services, you know, you would hear the, you know, sort of the old guys talking about, 
the differences between the, the Litvaks and the Galicianers, <laughs> the, the people who came from Lithuania and who came from Galicia, you know, and it was like, that's what a lot of the jokes sort of centered around, you know, these differences between Jews who came from different parts of the Pale of Settlement, the, uh, you know, the, the, the Eastern European, you know, the huge area of Eastern Europe that most immigrant Jews came from in the, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And I think the delicatessen really was a place where a more unitary kind of Jewish identity started to uh, started to emerge. Okay, so you had kosher delis uh, like like this one in Brooklyn, where you had the uh, the grill in the in the in the window with the with the franks and the knishes and so on and so forth. And um, and then you had the non-kosher delis, the delis in the in the theater district. And my PhD is in theater, so I'm you know, very interested in uh, sort of the growth of the, you know, the of Broadway um, and, 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 and a film, because remember the, you know, it, in the 1920s, it was both the theater and the film business, which were centered in, in Times Square, you know, silent films. And so a deli like Rubens had all these caricatures of all the celebrities of the day on the, on the menu. And um, so these were places that were very much imbued with the glitz and the glamour of, of, of this celebrity culture. I mean, there are places where you would try to, you know, you would hope to rub shoulders with a famous star of the stage or screen. And, um, you know, I, and we know from the places that started to open in the 30s, like the ones that, that uh, became very famous, the stage and the Carnegie Deli in New York, that the walls were plastered with photos of the celebrities. Actually, in, in, in a lot of these places, many of you no, the, the sandwiches themselves were named after the celebrities of, of the day. And that's something that was really puzzling to me. Like who would want to eat their favorite celebrity? You know, <laughs> what is that all about? They say we have a lot of aggression against people who are more famous and more successful than we are. So maybe, maybe that's what it was. I don't know, but the, the most interesting part to me is actually this very, very strange kind of relationship that obtained between the waiters and the countermen and the customers. Um, and some of you may remember this, if any of you grew up in New York or visited New York, if you walked into one of these places, you had to expect to be condescended to, to be belittled by, <laughs> to be insulted by the, the guy, you know, to be told where to sit, to be told what to eat, to be told you weren't ordering the right thing, you know, <laughs> it was kind of this very, almost like a comedy routine that, that went, that went on. And, uh, and so as a historian, you know, I mean, I, I was fascinated with this thing. You know, how did this happen? What was this about? And why would somebody want to sub subject themselves to that kind of treatment? And would they give a tip? Certainly not a big tip. Would they give a tip at all to somebody who, who lorded it over them in, in, in that way? You know, or did it paradoxically make them feel at home because nobody would talk to them like that unless they were their uncle or their, you know, grandfather or whatever. Um, and then I thought about some more and I did some more research and I, and I found out that a lot of these waiters were actually former, maybe failed actors and comedians from the Broadway stage, the Yiddish theater and so on and so forth. So maybe it was part of this shtick that they were still kind of doing, you know, or maybe there was actually, I mean, psychologically, maybe there was just a lot of resentment that was kind of bubbling under the surface because, you know, I mean, we were saying earlier about how you know, Jews really couldn't afford to eat meat back in Eastern Europe. They came to America and meat really was a symbol of affluence, you know? And so the waiter is stuck in this very kind of backbreaking, menial, low paying occupation. And he's sort of handing over, he's serving his social betters, you know, he's, he's serving these upwardly mobile customers, uh, this food that's, that's very symbolic. I mean, whenever I think about this, I can't help thinking about when I used to go to the Second Avenue Deli in New York, which, is, which isn't on Second Avenue anymore, but <laughs> it used to be on Second Avenue and 10th Street uh, in the East Village, just above the Lower East Side. Some people would say it's still part of the Lower East Side. And uh, there was this waitress there for many, many years. Her name was Diane Kastner. And she was an absolute sight to behold. You would not forget her even after one time being served by her because she had this black lacquered beehive hairdo, you know, and her face was pancaked with makeup and she had costume jewelry dripping all over her neck and whatever. And uh, so I would always make sure when I went to the Second Avenue Deli to order the matzo ball soup, because I love matzo ball soup. And the one thing about matzo ball soup is, I mean, people debate about whether the matzo balls need to be sinkers or floaters and how you're supposed to make them, whatever. Um, but 
for me, perhaps even more important than the type of matzo ball is just the temperature of the, the broth. You know, if, 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 if matzo ball soup isn't really piping hot, it just doesn't, it doesn't taste good at all. And the Second Avenue Deli, more than any other deli that I've ever been to, takes the greatest care to make sure that it stays hot. The way they do this is rather than bringing you the bowl of soup, and maybe it's cooled off in the interim by the time they can take it from the kitchen and bring it to you, whatever, is they, the bowl, they have an empty bowl in front of you and they bring a, a tin cup that has the soup in it and they pour the soup into your bowl while it's still hot. Perfect. So I would order the matzo ball soup and Diane would bring the soup and she always had the same shtick, you know, she always had the same line. She would say, as she poured it, she'd say, you'll be the richer, I'll be the poorer. And I was like, oh my God. And she seems so sad, you know, <laughs> like this must be very, very, this is not just a joke, you know, like there's something going on here. And uh, so ironically, I mean, she was there well into her eighties. She ended up getting fired and she sued the deli for age discrimination. And it was in all the tabloid newspapers in New York. I mean, everything involving the, the, the uh, second Avenue deli was in the tabloids in, in New York. They, they were always doing all these crazy stunts to get publicity. They were creating molds out of chopped liver of famous athletes and they were doing all kinds of contests. And, and then of course they were in the news a lot when their uh, owner, Abe Leibowal was, was killed, was murdered while he was on his way to the bank with the cash receipts from the, from the business. And that's an unsolved murder. Hopefully someday they'll solve it, but it's decades now. Um, and uh, she sued the Second Avenue Deli for, for age discrimination and she actually won. They admitted it, but um, she died before, uh, you know, it took so long to make it through the courts that she had passed away before the, the judgment was, was rendered. So it was a posthumous age discrimination victory against the second Avenue Deli. All right, so, uh, so I just wanna sort of say a couple words about this whole theme of, uh, uh, of the deli as a as a place of affluence, as a symbol of affluence, um, and I just want to I just want to point out. I mean, those of you I'm sure who have heard of Damon Runyon, he became very famous for his short stories when they were made into a Broadway musical called Guys and Dolls. Um, his stories are very much worth reading, though, uh, you know, in their own right. And, uh, and he, and he, he sets, he, there are scenes in Guys and Dolls and, um, and there are scenes in, 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 uh, in other stories of his that are set in a, in a fictional deli called Mindy's, but is based very much on Lindy's, um, which was an, another famous deli in New York. Actually, Harpo Marx, who grew up in New York in East Harlem with his brothers, traveled all around the country doing vaudeville. When he came back to New York, he said, I love coming back to New York because here I had two homes away from home. He said, Rubens and Lindy's. He said, these were places where I found my people speaking my language with my accent, right? Non-kosher delis, <laughs> where you could get pastrami, corn, you could also get all kinds of other fancy foods and things like that, right? Uh, anyway, Damon Runyon begins his short story, Butch Minds the Baby. Um, it's about a retired safe cracker who is uh, convinced to do one, to come out of retirement and do, and do another job. But the problem is he has an infant son and his wife is, is, uh, is, is out and he's promised her that he's not gonna let this little boy out of his sight. So he says, I will come and I will do the job, but I have to bring the kid with me. <laughs> uh, and he'll be quiet while I'm doing the safe crack. And you can imagine there are very hilarious uh, consequences and complications that ensue. But I just wanna read the first line of this, uh, the first sentence of this story, Butch Minds the Baby. One evening, along about seven o'clock, I am sitting in Mindy's restaurant. He fictionalized Lindy's to Mindy's. I am sitting in Mindy's restaurant, putting on the gefilte fish, which is a dish I am very fond of. When in comes three parties from Brooklyn wearing caps as follows, Harry the Horse, Little Isidore, and Spanish John. Okay, now this is bizarre, right? I'm sitting in a deli putting on the gefilte fish. What does this possibly mean? Where is he putting it? I mean, how do you put, how do you? <laughs> and, uh, you know, of, 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 of course, if you think about it a little bit, you know, what it's really referencing 
is another famous expression of the, of the interwar period, which is putting on the Ritz, which some of you, you know, may have an immediate association with Mel Brooks's film, Young Frankenstein, where the, the monster at the end of the movie does a whole kind of uh, uh, tap dance uh, routine with, uh, with uh, you know, the, the top hat and the cane and everything to uh, putting on the Ritz. Um, and also another expression actually that's, that's not so well known anymore, uh, putting on the dog, which refers to the fact that um, very, very wealthy women, including I think even Queen Elizabeth herself, or Queen Victoria, I mean herself, were, um, they had their portraits done with little dogs sitting on their lap. We actually ad adopted a, um, a toy poodle during the pandemic, which was supposed to be a, a rescue dog. And uh, we were supposed to give her back, but of course, uh, it never happens that way. <laughs> no, I don't think anybody ever gives those dogs back because <laughs> they capture your heart. Um, but uh, putting on the dog meant, you know, of course, the way that you that that you sort of showed that you were a, a you know a woman of leisure that you didn't uh, have to have to work for a living, have to do any kind of manual labor, was to have a little dog on your lap because when you have a little dog on your lap, you can't do anything. You know? <laughs> and so <laughs> it signifies, you know, your sort of your, you know, your, 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 your social class. So, um, all right. So all that I'm saying basically is that the stage deli was a stage for the customers. You know, it was a stage for, for, for Jews who were uh, really just beginning to become more successful in American society to be able to sort of exhibit their newfound social status. Now, of course, that, that's not entirely true because, you know, the 1920s were a very, very anti-Semitic period. I mean, you know, you had Henry Ford and the Dearborn Independent who was fulminating against Jews and how they were destroying America. And you had, um, you know, the rise of the KKK. I mean, you had a lot of bad stuff that was going on. And Jews were not allowed in, you know, more than very, very, you know, almost token numbers into universities and professional schools and hotels and country clubs and nice neighborhoods. I mean, Jews were very much excluded from, from American society. So it's hard to say that, um, you know, that this was a period of, you know, sort of really, you know, whole scale Jewish, um, you know, success. So I think in many ways that makes it even more interesting because the deli was a place where Jews could fantasize about a kind of acceptance that they hadn't yet achieved. And they did this through this kind of sense of, of, of vicarious celebrity that they were able to, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to experience. All right, uh, so moving on from that, Carnegie Deli was, um, uh, actually they didn't use caricatures or, or, or pictures of, of stars, but landmarks of, uh, of, 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 of Manhattan. And uh, I actually remember once I was on a flight to Paris and I, I was, I was reading the Air France in-flight magazine and it had a feature about New York and tourism to New York. And it said, the first place you need to go to New York, the first place, as soon as you land at the airport in New York, you need to make a beeline to the Carnegie Deli. <laughs> not to a Broadway show, not to the you know, Empire State Building, you know, whatever, <laughs> to the Carnegie Deli, the temple of Jewish gastronomy. You know, interesting, even just for the religious language, you know, that, that was the people there. All right, so Carnegie Deli, uh, of course, uh, very famous as the as a setting for for uh, actually a couple of scenes in Woody Allen's Broadway Danny Rhodes, um, in which the comedians are all sitting at the back uh, at, at a table in the back, sort of trading jokes and trying to one up one uh, one one another. Um, but but again, this whole idea of of excess of you know of uh, you know. The skyscraper sandwich, <laughs> very much part of the of the sort of culture of uh, of New York, and um, and also I want to say that it, it's important to note that I don't I don't want to I don't want to leave the impression that the deli was really only a, a New York phenomenon because obviously deli spread to other cities throughout the country, Chicago, uh, here Maxwell Street, sort of the immigrant district of Chicago, um, and 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 became particularly uh, appealing to uh, you know, to non-Jews, but to, but to African-Americans, I think, in particular. So I just want to play a quick, uh, a quick clip about that. The 
like to beat out a little number that's real groovy or rooney titled Dunking Bagels or Rowty Ragwooty. Root salad there. <laughs> Dunkin' Bagels, smash in the coffee. Matzo balls, ah, matzo balls and rooney. Gefilte fish, gefilte fish about me. Sandro, matzo me, ma, 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 ma. Herring, a pickle herring, a mac bounty. Dunkin' Bagels, Dunkin' Bagels. Okay, so <laughs> just to give a little taste, no pun intended, of, uh, and also, you know, matzo balls, gefilte fish, I mean, you know, just to get everybody ready for the Seder in a couple of nights. But this was Slim and Slam. They were a group in the 30s and 40s in New York who, uh, you know, I mean, really kind of, uh, uh, I guess you would say dug <laughs> Jewish food. Um, and uh, this is from a, from, from a later period. This is from the 70s, but... Um, just to sort of continue for a moment with this theme about, um, you know, sort of the deli as a place where not just Jews, but but all kinds of people really gravitated to. Um, here's another deli in Chicago that um, became exactly that type of a, of a gathering space. It happens every day. Some innocent out of towner finds himself on Grand Avenue at noontime, wants a nice quiet lunch, and decides he'll have it at Jerry's place. One of you move! Don't stand there looking! Down there, ma'am! Down there! Yes, sir! Up there! Up there, sir! Sir, come with me! Come with me, sir! This is it! Right here! Sir, ma'am! Wake up! And that is the worst mistake that out-of-towner could possibly make. Between 11.30 and 1 o'clock, Jerry's is not so much a delicatessen as a crucible in which office girls and hard hats and newspaper men and hippies and cops are crushed and insulted and manhandled and only the strong survive. You have to have some kind of death wish to go through this for a corned beef sandwich. The Lucifer of this inferno is Jerry Myers, his incredible mixed bag of customers aver that to know him is to love him. And he is lovable, sure enough. Shut up, Jerry! Stop! Well, what have you opened your mouth? Well, say it, man! It's just that indecision drives him crazy. Jerry Myers often throws indecisive customers out on the street. The well-trained ones steal themselves on the sidewalk, take a deep breath, and then hit the door ordering. All right, come on, there he is. Roast beef, lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise, and roll. What kind of salad he wants to know? Roll. Roast beef. Roast beef on a roll, lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise. A battalion of hot-eyed countermen trained by the master support Jerry and compliment him. Yours, sir. Yours. Well, Down here, please. But he is the impresario, and it's no good staying in your office and trying an end run to the hot pastrami because he answers the phones, too. Jerry's, go ahead, please. Go ahead, ma'am, please. That's all right, ma'am. There's four phones ringing. Talk fast, please. What else, ma'am? What else, ma'am? Extension number. It's been nice. Jerry's son, Michael, wrote an essay for school once which said, I admire one person very much. That person is my father. I want to be like him. He likes black and white the same. He is nice and kind to all people. Do you really get mad at customers sometimes? No, not mad in the sense of mad, no. Uh, it's... Uh... Mad in the sense that I must see them taken care of immediately. Our rule is if they're here after three minutes, they get their merchandise for nothing. This has been in my rule for 25 years. Uh, I've never given anything away yet. I think there's a person that actually feels something, that there is a, oh, a love of fellow man in there somewhere, even when I shout at him, even when I grab him by the hand. I think there is that a person actually knows it. Sure, the few individuals that say the hell with you, I've had them swear at me and run out. They don't want to take this, but those are the very few. I think people really know these things. Come on, walk faster. Leave room for somebody else. 
My father, wrote Jerry's son Mike, yells at the customer. But his store is the most integrated store in the world. It is a strange store. Papa! Almost lost him. Sir, you want to give your order? You want to stand there? Forget about it. Go to Walgreens. Mike, my boy, you said a mouthful. Okay, I guess I should explain in case there are people uh, who are from younger generations who might not understand the reference to Walgreens at the end that Woolworths and uh, other drugstores were known for their lunch counters actually became very important in the South during the civil rights movement where there were sit-ins um, and other kinds of protests. Uh, but anyway, the, the, you know, interesting kind of, uh, you know, glimpse at, uh, at the deli as a place where, you know, there, there is this, there's this very, uh, I don't know if you call them hostile, but uh, definitely, you know, um, very insulting <laughs> guy who, guy who runs the place, but somehow he manages to preside over this real melting pot of different cultures, but all in the context of, of Jewish food and the, and the, and the, and the Jewish deli. All right, um, this is Chicago. This is the Lawndale uh, neighborhood where Jews moved to after they left the, the Maxwell Street uh, neighborhood uh, on the west side. And you can see, I believe she's uh, the, the, well, the owner, the wife of the owner who's, who's uh, got one foot out the door. Um, you, there's also an African-American family. If you can see on the bottom right-hand corner, it's kind of a little bit hard to see. And, uh, and, and eventually Lawndale becomes an almost entirely African-American neighborhood. Now there were delis, there was one actually on, um, on uh, Maxwell Street where the, the Jewish deli owner uh, sold the deli to one of his African-American employees when he retired. And, uh, you know, the guy's name was Nate Duncan had uh, learned a lot of Yiddish by then. He knew how to make all the foods. And, uh, you know, again, I mean, it sort of morphed in a way from being a Jewish deli in a Jewish neighborhood to being a Jewish deli in an African-American neighborhood, but one that was also owned and operated by, uh, by, by an African-American. There's, there's also, I mean, if you think about the Blues Brothers, there's a great scene um, where Aretha Franklin uh, does this great production number, I think it's Imagine, um, in, a, in a deli in, uh, in, in, in Chicago, that they, they, they call it the Soul Food Cafe, but it's actually, you can actually see the deli signs out, outside. Okay, so moving right along, uh, this is also Chicago, um, uh, deli under the, uh, the elevated train tracks. That's why on the bottom it says elegant dining, under the cars. <laughs> all right, a little bit of humor there. Uh, all right, this is Manny's uh, coffee shop where Barack Obama uh, campaigned for, this is his first presidential, presidential run. Uh, and this is uh, Lemon City Diner, which is in the South Loop in, in, in Chicago. Okay, so back to New York. Uh, so I should just say um, very quickly that um, I did finally manage to answer that question of when the heyday of the deli was. It wasn't during the immigrant period, as I mentioned. It wasn't during the teens or 20s. It actually ended up being the 1930s, which really surprised me. It was the height of the Great Depression. There were 1,550 kosher delis in the five boroughs of New York City. 1,550. So you know that this was a place that was very, very important for Jews to be able to come together and sort of weave those bonds of community at a time when they were going through and, and the whole country was going through a really, really terrible economic time. You also can sort of infer that there were lots of affiliated industries like the bakers and the pickle makers and uh, the joggers and the truckers and so on, who, uh, you know, it's just a huge part. I mean, I haven't been able to quantify it, but it's a huge, huge part of the overall economy of, of New York City. And, um, and again, I mean, the, you know, Delicatessen really was a place where Jews who were becoming more secular in their orientation and their outlook, you know, were able to, in some sense, replace what they had uh, had in the past in the, in the synagogue, in this, uh, in this secular commercial space. So, uh, for example, Alfred Kazin was an important New York intellectual of the 1930s. He has a wonderful memoir uh, called A Walker in the City. And uh, I'll just read a quote from that, from that book. Um, but our greatest delight in all seasons was delicatessen, hot spiced corned beef, pastrami, rolled beef, hard salami, soft salami, chicken salami, he really liked salami, uh, bologna, frankfurter specials, which were the kind of big oversized, you know, not worse kinds of things. Um, and the thinner wrinkled hot dogs always taken with mustard and relish and sauerkraut. And, whenever possible to make the treat fully real with potato salad, baked beans, 
and French fries which had been bubbling in the black wire fryer deep in the iron pot. At Saturday twilight, as soon as the delicatessen store reopened after the Sabbath rest, we raced into it, panting for the hot dogs, sizzling on the gas plate just inside the window. The look of the blackened empty gas plate had driven us wild all through the, worries, the wearisome, wearisome Sabbath day. And now as the electric sign blazed up again, lighting up the words Jewish national delicatessen, it was as if we had entered into our rightful heritage. And this was before he had taken a bite, right? I mean, it was just seeing that sign lighting up, you know? I mean, kind of incredible to think about it. It's like there's this famous uh, saying of uh, Reb Nachman of Bratzla, uh, the Hasidic master, that uh, he, he says that the Torah is, is, is black fire written on white fire, you know? And that kind of like, that, that's what, this was like the secular equivalent of that, was this, you know, these phantasmic colored tubes, you know, lighting up with this, with this, with this uh, luminous gas. Um, and one of the things that's been really exciting to me about, about doing this research is not just doing the, you know, the, the actual archival research and interviews and things, but, but, but collecting memorabilia. I mean, for 10 years, I collected everything that I could find on eBay. Um, so I have these neon signs and I have these electric light up clocks and I have all these, you know, menus and matchbooks and asterisks. I mean, I just have a, a, just a huge amount of stuff that hopefully someday will be, be able to be exhibited somewhere. But, um, you know, it's just like being able to actually own a tangible piece of this history has been really, really fulfilling for me. Um, okay, so I want to get back to um, chronologically, we're talking about the 30s. And I just want to say very briefly about the 1940s that um, I think the, uh, you know, the, the sign that hung in Katz's Deli and other places, send a salami to your boy in the army, send a salami to your boy in the army, which doesn't rhyme unless you say it with like my grandparents, New York, Brit uh, I was going to say British because I actually heard on, on, on NPR not too long ago that the, that the, that the, that the Jewish accent with the, with the, with the dropped R actually derives from a British accent. <laughs> I don't know how that happened though. I didn't understand how that actually happened, but that there's some connection between them. Anyway, um, so, so, so this, this gets back for me. I mean, I just look at this image and it gets back to what I was saying about the, about the etymology of the word delicatessen, about this concept of delicatus, right? As having a, a kind of erotic undertone to it. You know, I mean, it, it, this just seems to me to be very, very phallic. I mean, I can't get around it, you know, like sending this huge hard salami to your, to your son in the army to give him that boost of virility, you know, and masculinity to enable him to defeat the enemy and, and return safely to the bosom of his family, right? I mean, it's just, I don't know, it's really sexualized to me. And if you don't really believe that, then, I mean, just look at the ads that the, that the kosher sausage companies used after, after the Second World War, um, you know, where they would dress up these buxom blonde models, you know, in very skimpy clothing and uh, put all these sausages very suggestively behind them and have her hold one in front of her. And so this was actually, this ad was, was, uh, was used on the occasion of the 1 billionth Hebrew national hot dog that was sold in the United States in 1952. And, you know, you kind of have to look at this and say, yes, there was this, there was this idea that sex really sells. And if, if you don't believe it on that, then look at this one. I mean, this was Zion Kosher. This was Hebrew national's main competitor in the early part of the 20th century. I mean, <laughs> this to me is definitely an homage to the um, famous uh, banana skirt that Josephine Baker uh, danced in, danced in in, uh, in Paris in the 1920s. And, and, but yet it's got this crazy like bondage thing going on and this like, what looks to me like dynamite around her head. I mean, I don't know if she's a terrorist. I mean, the whole thing is just crazy, but clearly very, very hyper, hyper sexualized. Okay. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> there was also, this is kind of going from the, the uh, ridiculous to the absurd or whatever. Um, on the other hand, the, um, the same companies um, that were using this very sexualized advertising were also trying to promote the idea of the deli or the idea of deli food at any rate, because there weren't as many delis anymore. I mean, by the 19, you know, 50s, 60s, I mean, a, a lot of delis had closed as their customer base had, had kind of fled for the suburbs. And uh, there were delis in the suburbs, but not anywhere near as many as there had been in the urban neighborhoods. And, um, you know, but, but they were 
kind of trying to have both ways because they were also advertising this food as very wholesome and very sanitary, you know, and so listen to this, uh, to this radio spot. A transcription. For that old fashioned flavor that all the folks favor, try Hebrew national meats. They're a treat to be sure, cause the beef is so pure in Hebrew national meats. You'll find corned beef and roast beef, salami, pastrami, and wonderful frankfurters too. They are surely delicious and purely nutritious, those Hebrew national, Hebrew national, Hebrew national meats. So this is obviously before Hebrew National developed its famous advertising slogan about, you know, that their products answer to a higher authority. Um, but uh, it's very interesting how they are, I think, kind of combating what is a stereotype about Jewish deli foods, you know, that were, there was something, I mean, and Alfred Kaysen actually writes about this in another section of his, of, his, of, his, of his memoir. You know, this was food, he says, that was made in dark barrels in the dank basements, you know, I mean, back in the city, it was like, you know, nobody really, you know, it was like, there was something very disreputable if <laughs> you thought about it, you know, kind of far from the light of day, he says, you know, and then it was served in these places that were the, maybe the floor was covered with sawdust and they weren't really that clean and there were flies and there were, you know what I mean? Like there was, you know, they, they had to sort of like reinvent in some sense. They had to recreate for a, for a, for a, for a non-Jewish audience, you know, that had all kinds of stereotypes about Jews, that this food was something that everybody could enjoy and that was kind of pure and sanitary and so on. And, and, and not only that, but that as Jews were moving to the suburbs and they were, they were driving along the new highways that were being built during the Eisenhower administration and later that uh, that this food wouldn't be polluting the, uh, the the environment. So they were giving out these plastic bags. This is from my collection um, so that people would have a, a garbage bag for the for the car. And a company like Zion Kosher was giving its salespeople these uh, these cards to go out to the places that the majority of deli food was being sold by this by this post-war period, which was in supermarkets. And what, what's really ironic about this image, I think, I mean, it's funny because it's got beef crisp at the top, which was like a, a kosher kind of bacon and it has kishka in the middle. Um, but uh, I think what's, uh, what's also really ironic about it is that, look, I mean, the whole notion of deli foods, you know, of these, of these meats is that they're, they were, they were, they were salted and smoked and, and, and spice to, to preserve them, right? This is an ancient technique that goes back thousands of years of how you keep food in the absence of, of refrigeration from spoiling. And now what they were doing is taking these foods that are already preserved in that fashion and sort of re-preserving them by putting them in plastic, you know, shrink wrapping and vacuum packing and using the technologies that have been developed during World War II to, to keep food fresh as it was being sent over long distances. And, and now this was something that, you know, like became part of American culture during the time period in which people were moving into these suburban houses with these big, you know, beautiful kitchens and with refrigerators and freezers. And the more processed food was, the better it was. <laughs> the more space age, the more exciting, right? I mean, it's so interesting how things have really come full circle from, uh, from when the more processed food was, the, the more interesting and exciting, uh, you know, it was. And they also ran these, I mean, Hebrew National, these ran these very crazy competitions where people would come up with their favorite sandwiches and you know it's interesting to me that they actually i mean if these are real i don't know but they put their names and addresses in the actual uh, with the uh, with their the sandwiches that they that they invented as if to show that you know this is food for like you know for everybody for ordinary people and yet these people all well maybe they're not all jewish a few of them have jewish names that's for sure um and then of course delis were very much known for so we talked about takeout we talked about eating in restaurants but also catering. And deli owners who I interviewed told me that, you know, it was basically a third eat in the restaurant, a third takeout from the deli counter and a third catering. That's what their business was, was based on. Um, and I've been told, I really don't believe it. Um, since I have three children, all daughters, two of them are, have already had their uh, bat mitzvah. The third one was supposed to be in February, but we postponed it because of the pandemic. But, um, uh, the reason we postponed it is because she she just insisted on having the kind of really lavish kind of you know affairs that her that her older sisters had had you know with the big party and you know all that kind of thing. What I've been told is that in the 1960s, say, you know, Jews were living in the suburbs of major cities, 
would, um, they'd have their service in the synagogue. They come back to the, to the house. They would fill up the bathtub with, uh, with, with, with bottles of soda and beer and, and ice. And they would order these circular, you know, these round trays of deli sandwiches. And they would sit around in the backyard. And that was a bar or bat mitzvah party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as I say, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really believe it. All right, um, and then we have uh, Rascal House. Uh, if, if anyone has been to Miami Beach, you know Wolfie's uh, uh, Rascal House. Um, this is Boston. This was a very famous deli called the G and G, and this is a local politician in the in the white in the white shirt who um, he just gave his business card, you know, just had the address of the deli. He didn't have an office. He just sort of did all his business in the deli. Um, uh, oh, well, this is new. So, well, I should say G and G was a place where, um, I mean, the deli was a place where politicians, whether Jewish or not, if they wanted to win the Jewish vote, they went to the Jewish deli. <laughs> and, uh, G and G, I mean, even JFK was photographed, you know, eating hot dogs and kishka and whatever at, uh, at the G&G &G. On, on election night, they would put out a big bandstand and they would announce the results and whatever. It was the place to be, even in New York, right? In the 70s, you have, um, you have instead of naming the sandwiches after the uh, actors, uh, they, they, they name them after uh, politicians. Okay. Um, all right. And of course, in LA, um, Cantor's on Fairfax Avenue. This, is, this was actually a spoof of My Fair Lady in which the, um, in which the Julie Andrews character uh, finds herself in, a, in an entirely Jewish neighborhood and she has to assimilate into that whole culture. She has to learn Yiddish. She has to develop an appreciation for Jewish foods and so on. So it's, it's kind of like this fantasy. What if the world were Jewish? <laughs> and rather than Jews having to assimilate into American culture, what if Americans had to assimilate into Jewish culture? Which I think is a really wonderful idea. Um, okay. Oh, and Nate Niles in Beverly Hills, which was Larry King, of course, in the late Larry King's uh, hangout for many years, where he had breakfast every morning with his with his friend. All right. So uh, I want to move along pretty quickly because the time is running short. Um, okay. So after World War II, as I said, Jews were moving to the suburbs, and um, many many Jews had served in in the military, had uh, served in exotic, faraway places like the South Pacific had discovered all kinds of food, you know, I mean, even if they came from kosher homes, uh, there was this idea of, uh, of eating ham for Uncle Sam. <laughs> uh, and uh, they had given, get, given up that, you know, the, their, their, you know, they'd had to give up eating those things, uh, other than the hard salamis that they were, they were sent. And, um, and so they had developed, an, they had begun to develop an appreciation for other cultures and for other cuisines. And uh, also you have new immigrant groups that are coming to the United States, including Asians, uh, particularly in the 1960s. And uh, so here's an example of, uh, of that from one of my favorite all time Jewish comedians and singers, Alan Sherman. It might take a minute to get started. If you like Hungarian food, they have a goulash, which is very good. Or if you wish a dish that's Chinese, somewhere down in column B, there's lobster Cantonese. Enchiladas, that's what people eat in Mexico. Shish kebab is skewered in Armenia, you know. Then there's blubber, the favorite of the frigid Eskimo. Such delicious dishes, no matter where you go. Chicken cacciatore is Italian. Kangaroo souffle must be Australian. Mutton chops are definitely British. Chicken soup undoubtedly is Yiddish. Palm pernicle comes from Lithuania. Hansen. Fair comes from Pennsylvania. Wiener schnitzel's Austrian or German. Kindly pass the sour Braten Herman. Borscht is what they're eating in the Soviet. Wait, I think we've got some on the stove yet. <laughs> See the mouse. Mouse 
underneath the jungle sky. Jolly Mau Mouse eating missionary pie. <laughs> Frenchmen eat a lot of bouillabaisse there. Dutchmen eat a sauce called hollandaise there. Smorgasbord in Sweden is the winner. In America, it's TV dinner. <laughs> so there you have one food from each land each one delicious each one simply grand mix them all up in one big mishmash and what have you got hungarian goulash hey wow. okay and here you also have, if you look in the bottom right, there's also this uh, very sly sort of uh, sexualized symbol here with the Cupid and the, and the sausage and the whatever. But the point, of course, of the song is that, you know, Americans, including Jews, and it's very much a Jewish song in the sense that it's sung with a, you know, with a sort of a Jewish accent and everything, uh, that uh, there are all kinds of other ethnic foods that Jews are, uh, are, are encountering and are uh, in many ways preferring to their, you know, to, the, to, to their own traditional foods. And uh, none more popular actually than, than, than Chinese food. And uh, which starts at a place called Bernstein's on Essex on uh, Essex Street on the Lower East Side of New York. And where they start by serving Chinese food one night a week and then two nights a week. And then eventually, you know, it's, it's a deli that also is equally a Chinese restaurant. And people have told me about, they remember the, uh, the tall Chinese waiters with the tasseled skull caps. <laughs> so it was kind of a merger of Jewish and Chinese culture in some sense. And I love this picture because I don't know, I have this I have this idea in mind that this is a he looks like a bar mitzvah boy to me in a very uncomfortable suit. <laughs> uh, who's maybe uh, you know, after he had his bar mitzvah or whatever, he's going out with his mother and his and his sister for uh, for, for you know the Bernstein's on Essex here. This, this may be hard to see, but if you see on the bottom right, you can kind of see what looks like maybe it's the owner and the owners or the couple that own it who are are looking out the window. But between them, there's a sign that says chow mein on a bun for 20 cents. This is a kosher deli in Brooklyn. Um, so even if it wasn't, even if there wasn't a lot of Chinese food in a deli, they were they, they had to have something, you know, they had to find something, some kind of Chinese food that they were gonna that they were gonna serve. Okay, another reason, of course, why Jews began in many ways to sort of turn their backs on deli food. If we've traced sort of the rise of the deli, then now we're kind of tracing the, the fall of it to a certain extent, unfortunately, um, is that this food is, is perceived uh, basically correctly as being very, very unhealthy, right? As being you know, laden with fat and cholesterol and sodium and, and so on and so forth. So this is actually a, a, a Canadian folk singer named uh, Shelley Posen, and he has a song about this. I used to feel so guilty when sitting down to dine About how much I like to eat and where my tastes incline But lately I have realized as I pile my plate with food That given where I'm coming from, I'm eating as I should for if the good Lord had meant Jews to eat healthy food, he would never have given us kishka. He'd have given us tofu like they eat in Japan. He'd have made rusks and dulls part of our diet plan. He'd have never allowed us salami, chopped liver, corned beef, or pastrami. If God had meant Jews to have healthy insides, he would never have made us eat matzah, on Passover, we'd eat granola instead. Or, you know, come to that, he just let us eat bread. As it is, we go all out of kilter by dining on fish that's gefilter. If the Kadosh Baruch Hu had meant Jews to eat right, we'd have never found out about flunkin'. We'd have had chicken soup and a noodle or two. But knishes, forget it, they'd be strictly taboo. And we'd never have grown to adults if as children our tongues had touched schmaltz. If Jews had been meant to be athletes and jocks, we'd have never been tempted by kugel. We'd have just eaten yogurt and crispy rice cakes and for breakfast some fruit with dry toast or bran flakes and we'd all spend the night in detox 
just for eating cream cheese with our locks. Now none of these arguments works on my dad, who eternally hawks me a chiney, saying, son, you are digging your grave with your teeth, and we'll have to sit shiver when you're underneath. This is not just an old cucker fibbin'. That's what happens to those who fresh ribbon. All right. Now I'm expecting that those of you who might not know all of these terms are looking them up on your phone while I'm while I'm speaking. Schmaltz is chicken fat. Um, uh, what else? Oh, Kishka I mentioned before is uh, stuffed uh, stuffed cow's intestines stuffed with breadcrumbs and all kinds of stuff. Um, what else? Um, oh, um, hawking a chinik means uh, literally in Yiddish it means hawkmir uh, nishkein chinik means don't bang on my teapot means don't piss me off basically. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of anything else, but, uh, but uh, definitely look up some of these things if you don't know what they are. All right. Um, okay. So, I mean, the best example, the absolute best example, most classic example of, uh, you know, this idea of the, of the deleterious health consequences of eating deli food comes from a uh, Saturday, Saturday Night Live episode uh, starring John Belushi. And now, another episode of Samurai Delicatessen. Hey! 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 Uh, can I have a sandwich, please? Put it in the Combination cold cut sandwich. Sure. Very lean on the corned beef. Sure. And a cream soda. Uh, uh. Yeah! Yeah! I'm sure glad I found you open. You know, most of the places are closed this late. Uh. Yeah! Please. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she can hardly wait for that old Super Bowl tomorrow, huh? <laughs> you know, I like Dallas, but I'm yeah. going to bet on the Steelers. The way I see it, if Bradshaw is hot tomorrow yeah, and Franco yeah. Harris really gets the ball and runs, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> could I have a little, uh, a little sliced tomato on that? Please? <laughs> Anyway, like I said, if they let Harris handle the ball, if they keep it on the ground for a while and really move up there in that first quarter, no major injury. Hey, listen, you do really fantastic work. That is gorgeous. Can you do me one little favor? Could you trim away some of the fat? I distinctly said no fat. There's a lot of fat hanging off it. I, I really said no fat, and it's a... Hey, oh, no, no, wait a minute. Oh, don't take it personally. It's okay. Look, I probably... I, I probably shouldn't be eating that anyway because it's filled with spices. It gives me heartburn. And, well, what the hell? You only live once. I'll deal with the pain later. Would it be... Uh, would it be too much to ask if you could cut it in half? <laughs> That's absolutely beautiful. Thank you very much. That's terrific. Uh, one other thing. Would you bet? You think you could break a 20? All 
All right, so by now you're starting to see a theme, right? The, uh, the, the super aggressive you know, uh, owner or, or guy behind the counter. Um, I mean, I think what this, what this episode shows, this was actually uh, aired at a time when there was a mercury scare in the, in the US food system. So according to Alan Zweibel, who, who wrote this sketch, who I, who, who I tracked down, uh, you know, he said he grew up working at Delhi, blah, 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 but that he was really kind of trying to you know, riff on this, uh, the fears at the time about whether or not the American food supply was, was safe. But, you know, I mean, he really is pointing to this very interesting sort of facet of the Jewish deli, in which case, you know, in which the deli is a dangerous place. You know, I mean, like if the, if this food doesn't get you, then the crazy homicidal suicidal guy behind the counter will, you know? <laughs> um, and uh, so it go definitely goes back to what we were talking about before in terms of this very strange relationship between the, the, uh, the counterman and, and the customer. Of course, this reaches its climax, not in, uh, uh, you know, um, I guess you would say an overtly Jewish uh, show, but uh, I mean, maybe you would. Seinfeld, I guess is kind of overtly Jewish. Um, the soup Nazi, right? This is kind of a precursor to that in an interesting way. The other thing that it's an interesting precursor to is that, you know, uh, over time, uh, you know, deli food is not served anymore at uh, at Jewish simchas, at Jewish uh, celebrations. But there is a food that becomes very, very popular and almost like de rigueur at Jewish, uh, uh, at Jewish affairs, which is sushi. So maybe this, maybe he's the sushi chef, you know, who's sort of ahead of his time. I, I don't know. All right, so um, I wanna play a couple more clips and then, and then, and then take questions. But, um, and I wanna to get to when Harry met Sally. So. Um, so when Harry met Sally, very, very famous scene set in Katz's, probably the most famous deli scene of all time. And what I want to suggest is that scene, which I'll play in a moment, is actually based on an earlier scene in another movie in Woody Allen's very famous film, classic film, Annie Hall. And Annie Hall is like when Harry met Sally, it's about a Jewish guy who is uh, romancing a non-Jewish woman. And uh, this is the scene from, uh, from their first date. He takes her to a deli. I was awful. I'm so ashamed. I can't think. Oh, listen, so the audience was a tad restless. What do you mean a tad restless? Oh, my God. I mean, they hated me. No, I... they didn't. You have a wonderful voice. No, I'm going to quit. No, I'm not going to let you. You have a great voice. Really? Do you think so, really? Yeah. Yeah? That's well, terrific. Yeah, you know something? I never even took a lesson, either. Hey, listen, you know? listen. What? Give me a kiss. Yeah, why not? Because we're just going to go home later, right? And, and uh, there's going to be all that tension, you know, we never kissed before, and I'll never know when to make the right move or anything. <laughs> so we'll kiss now, we'll get it over with, and then we'll go eat, okay? Oh, uh, We'll digest our food better. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So now we can digest our food, yeah, digest okay? It. Yeah. I'm going to have the corned beef. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm going to have a pastrami on white bread with uh, mayonnaise and tomatoes and lettuce. All right, so <laughs> he takes her to a Jewish death. Okay, this is, I don't actually, I don't think it's their first date. It's, but it's very clearly, this is sort of foreplay in a way. I mean, this, they, they've kind of decided, he says, we're going to go home afterwards, whatever. This is when they're going to sleep together for the, for the first time. It's going to be this night. And uh, he takes her to the Carnegie Deli. And um, he obviously has not coached her. He hasn't advised her. He hasn't told her when you go to a deli. There are certain things that you just don't order. You know, I mean, actually it was Milton Berle who had this famous joke that, you know, every time someone goes into a Jewish deli and orders a pastrami on white bread with mayonnaise, somewhere a Jew dies, right? <laughs> you just don't order that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but he doesn't, he doesn't tell her that, you know? I mean, which I think is interesting because by not telling her that, he lets her order that and sort of humiliate herself, at least in his, in his eyes. You can see his eyes, you can see his contempt, you know, or his like, you know, puzzlement or, or, or whatever, which, which, which I think is kind of looking down on her. And, you know, what's, what's interesting about it is, you know, so why does he take her to, the, to a deli then in the first place? He's kind of the demasculinized, stereotypically demasculinized Jewish man. The deli is the one place where he really feels like he's at home. You know, he sort of knows the social codes and everything. He knows how this place works. And so he can feel, he's very fragile in terms of his masculinity, but he can, you know, he can sort of feel better about himself somehow if he, uh, you know, if, if he allows her to, uh, you know, to sort of make a fool of herself. 
Now, so what's interesting about this is that when Harry met Sally, right, is, is you know, sort of the same situation, the Jewish man taking the non-Jewish woman to a deli, but in that case, she turns the tables on him by showing him that he's not as masculine as he thinks he is, right? It's all about masculinity in, in both, I think, uh, because he can't tell when she's having a sexual climax. Uh, oh, sorry, this is, uh, this is, you know, obviously George Costanza uh, not, not, not being able to decide if he wants to eat the sandwich or jump to bed with the, with the woman. Uh, so similar theme. Uh, but anyway, let's get to when Harry met Sally. I'm going to just jump ahead a little bit to uh, to uh, to the beginning of the scene. So what do you do with these women? You just get up out of bed and leave? Sure. Well, explain to me how you do it. What do you say? Just have an early meeting, early haircut, early squash game. You don't play squash. I don't know that. They just met me. I know I feel terrible. You know, I'm so glad I never got involved with you. I just would have ended up being some woman you had to get up out of bed and leave at 3 o'clock in the morning and go clean your and irons. And you don't even have a fireplace. Not that I would know this. Why are you getting so upset? This is not about you. Yes, it is. You are a human affront to all women, and I am a woman. Hey, I don't feel great about this, but I don't hear anyone complaining. Of course not. You're out the door too fast. I think they have an OK time. How do you know? I mean, how do I know I know? Because they... Yes, because they... How do you know that they're really... What are you saying? That they fake orgasm? It's possible. Get out of here. Why? Most women at one time or another have faked it. Well, they haven't faked it with me. How do you know? Because I know. Oh. Right. That's right. I forgot. You're a man. What is that supposed to mean? Nothing. It's just that all men are sure it never happened to them, and most women at one time or another have done it, so you do the math. You don't think that I can tell a difference? No. Get out of here. Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh. Oh, God. Ooh. Oh, God. Oh. 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 Oh, God. Oh, yeah, right there. I'll have what she's having. All right, that of course is Estelle Reiner, the director's, uh, Carl Reiner's mother. And, uh, you know, I mean, this, I think it really brings together a lot of what we've talked about tonight. You know, I mean, the Delicatessen has this place that's very relaxed, I guess you would say. I mean, uh, I mean, almost primitive, right? I mean, if you think about it, I mean, Jews developed this eatery in which they could really let their hair down. You know, they could eat with their hands. They, I mean, they could eat with their hands. They could, they could talk with their hands. They could eat with their mouths full. They could, you know, do everything that they couldn't do when they went into a more sort of genteel or gentile establishment where Jews were stereotyped as being vulgar and uncouth and lacking in manners and so on and so forth, right? And, um, you know, this place that also had all this vibe of sort of, you know, Yiddish culture and, and again, you know, sort of the the salamis hanging, sausages and everything hanging very suggestively. You know, I mean, there was something about this place from the beginning that is being encapsulated in this uh, very interesting performance by this non-Jewish woman who seems to be uh, enjoying <laughs> her meal or enjoying at any rate being in this space. She seems to have connected to something about the Lower East Side and the lack of privacy and the tenement neighborhood and all of that. And to Jewish culture and 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 
and so on in, in a way that, uh, you know, is really quite striking. But there's something missing. And I want to just play one final clip. Um, so think about what's actually missing from this clip. That's been a major theme that we've been talking about tonight. And I'm going to play um, a takeoff on this scene um, just to illustrate that. And then we'll be done. <laughs> I don't know, I think, uh, I think the women are pretty satisfied. Are you sure that they're genuinely satisfied? That they're not saying, pretending to be satisfied? You're saying that they're faking? Yes. I'm pretty sure I could tell. I could tell. Okay. Oh, all right. You all right? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh. oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, 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 yeah, oh, 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 yes, 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 oh, yeah. yes. So, uh, so what was missing from the When Harry Met Sally is that it was an individual experience that this one customer was having, or at least pretending to be having. And here, it's a collective experience, you know? I mean, I guess you call it sort of a group sexual experience. I don't know, but it's, a, it's, it's something that's communal, right? I mean, actually, what's interesting is this was made five or six years ago. You would, never, you would never do it quite like this anymore with only white actors in it, right? I mean, the only woman of color is the one at the end. I mean, who has like a speaking part basically is the one at the end who's the waitress who declines to participate, right? I mean, if you were shooting it now, you'd probably shoot it and you'd have a much more multicultural, you know, aspect to it if you're gonna do a flash mob like this. But the, but the point is that the deli was a place where both Jews and non-Jews could experience Jewish culture in a pleasurable way that really sort of spoke to the, you know, in many ways, the fullness of, of, of Jewish tradition and the celebration of life. And, um, and I just want to say, oh, I just want to show, um, you know, in case this comes up during the, during the question and answer period, that, uh, you know, unfortunately, there are a couple of things that are unfortunate. One is that uh, we don't really have a lot of these spaces anymore. Uh, the, the deli was, um, you know, maybe in some sense, the, the, the last of its breed of places where Jews could gather outside of the synagogue to be able to sort of create the bonds of community. Um, my kids go to Jewish summer camp, but they don't learn anything about, uh, they learn very, very little about Eastern European Jewish culture there, right? It's much, much more based on Hebrew language and, uh, and, and Hebrew food and Hebrew uh, and Israeli food and Jewish culture in that sense. Um, and the foods that used to be really, um, you know, um, distinctive of the Jewish deli are now part of American culture, uh, you know, writ large. Uh, pastrami and bagels and so on are just as much American foods as, as Jewish foods. So, uh, 
you know, lest anyone think that I'm not uh, nostalgic or, um, you know, that, that I don't have a sense of uh, sadness about, uh, about this culture that it's, it's kind of disappeared, um, I, you know, I do. But I'm very happy to take questions about that in the, in the Q&A. All right, thank you very much. Ted, thank you so much. Can I, can I ask everyone just to unmute for a minute and give Ted a hand uh, before we take questions? Ted, thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, uh, so, um, if anybody has questions, I think they, um, you know, can either put them in the chat box and I'll read them out loud, or just uh, since uh, Ted stopped screen sharing, you can just raise your hand, uh, uh, whatever you prefer. Uh, what's my favorite deli food? Uh, I don't actually love pastrami, believe it or, or not. Um, I, my, my actual favorite deli food is something called kasha varnishkis, which, oh, no. <laughs> which you've probably never heard of. If you are Jewish, you probably know all about. But it's actually, technically, uh, it looks like a grain, but I think it's botanically an herb. It's uh, toasted buckwheat groats with bow tie noodle. <laughs> uh, now here, noodles with buckwheat. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, other questions? I, Ted, I guess I have a question. Sure. How, how, why, why did the deli, um, what, what, what's your explanation for why it, it sort of disappeared so precipitously? Um, I'm assuming I mean, that's, assuming yeah. I'm, I'm correct in that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, you know, the changes that happened after the Second World War were very, were very sweeping and very dramatic. And um, I think the deli very quickly began to seem like a kind of, you know, um, like a kind of, um, what's it called, like from bygone days, like a, uh, you know, mm -hmm. something that, um, you know, it, it, it really was perceived, and I think to some extent is still perceived, even though, as I said, it really wasn't so much a phenomenon of the, of the immigrant Jewish um, you know, streetscape or whatever, uh, foodscape, um, it was perceived that way. I mean, that, that was what was interesting to me was that we had all these associations with Jewish deli food as, you know, it came from Eastern Europe and it came with the immigrants and whatever. And, and neither of those are true. I mean, Jews really ate almost no meat in, in, in Eastern Europe. I mean, it was really a luxury. It was, I mean, there's a joke in, um, there's a joke in Fiddler on the Roof where somebody says, um, you know, and this is about chicken. It wasn't even about beef. He said, if, you know, if you remember, it says if, if a poor man eats a chicken on the Sabbath, then, then one of them must be sick. <laughs> I mean, Jews didn't have access to grazing land. They, I mean, they, they didn't have beef, you know, I mean, like a, a meal in, in, you know, in Poland, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago was like a, you know, a sour pickle and a slice of rye bread. I mean, they had almost no protein even. I mean, how they even lived is kind of, you know, hard to, hard to fathom. And, um, so I think as Jews became more upwardly mobile and, um, you know, more successful in American society, I think, you know, they, they didn't want to be stereotyped, uh, you know, in, in a lot of different ways. And they, and they didn't want to see themselves as still kind of living an extension of that. Uh, I mean, it's not that they didn't have nostalgia. I mean, there were a lot of, um, Hasi Dina writes, writes, about, writes about this in her work on American Jewish history. Um, you know, there was, there were a lot of trips back to the Lower East Side and there, you know, but it was, it was limited. It was like, you know, let's go see Fiddler on the Roof and then we'll be done with it. And we can go back to our, you know, kind of upper middle-class suburban lifestyle. So I think, you know, the, the deli was sort of doomed, um, as long as it still carried those kinds of associations with it. What happened more recently in the last, say, 20 or 30 years is that the, de that deli food actually more in the last, I wouldn't, wouldn't say 30 years, maybe 15 or 20 years, is that deli food started to be reinvented in an interesting ways. So that you have delis now that have sprung up in various cities where they've taken the concept and they've sort of divorced it from those earlier associations and, you know, and, and try to bring deli into the 21st century and have delis serving only, you know, like, grass-fed beef in like smaller portions, you know, with homemade sodas and with bean sprouts and, you know, whatever. And, you know, and so it's kind of an interesting question, like whether the deli can survive in a 21st century context in which we have totally radically different ideas about food than our, than our ancestors did. Thank you. Other questions?
anything that I said was not clear that, 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 or didn't connect or that somehow like you weren't sure of when I was speaking about it, like that it just, you didn't quite get the point that I was trying to make or the term that I was using <laughs> or the food that I was referring to, <laughs> or it just seemed a little bit, uh, a little odd to you in terms of uh, the, the, you know, the argument that I would, that, that I was trying to make um, because I've definitely in the past heard that, uh, that I'm stretching a little bit, certainly when it comes to some of the more, uh, you know, sort of erotic, uh, you know, associations with deli food, but, but for me, they're, they're pretty inescapable. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have a hard time not going that way. And I think the, the, you know, the fact that that scene from When Harry Met Sally is the kind of all time most famous de deli scene, I think, you know, it speaks volumes about, uh, uh, about that. And I think it's, it's partly that, you know, Jewish comedy for, for better or for worse, Jewish comedy is, is, is associated. I mean, you know, not that there aren't comedians of other ethnicities who use very kind of, you know, uh, off color, humor, because, you know, that's, that's obviously true. But um, I think there's something about, you know, Jewish comedy in particular, that's seen as sort of boundary breaking in, in some way, and, um, you know, pushing, the, pushing the envelope, um, you know, in, in you know, in, in a very important respect. So of course, the deli humor, I mean, just naturally, uh, is an outgrowth of that, I think. Well, <laughs> it, I I'm going to ask a question from the audience and then, then maybe we'll make this the last question of the evening. Uh, and I, uh, since it was to, to me directly, I, maybe she doesn't want, didn't want to send it to everyone, but do you think that when Delhi started serving Trafe, did mm -hmm. that start their downfall? Did the, uh, did, did, did the breakaway from, from uh, kosher delis mean the end of the Jewish deli? Do you think there's, that, that, that had anything to do with their- I mean, that's an interesting way of, of framing it because you could just as easily see it from the opposite point of view. You could say that, you know, for, for a generation of Jews that was really starting to, to, to acculturate in many ways, um, maybe that was the saving grace in, in a way. Maybe delis would have, would have sort of started to fade out a lot sooner if they hadn't developed that kind of non-kosher variant. But one of the things that I'm trying to suggest is that actually the kosher and the non-kosher grew up simultaneously. I mean, when I, when I was writing the book, you know, I would often hear from people, you know, so you're writing about, I mean, from Jews at least, you know, so you're writing about the kosher deli in New York. And I said, yes, but you know, you can't write about the deli in New York and not write about non-kosher delis as, as well, because they were very, very important. And, um, and, they were, and they were so much a part of the mystique of, of, of Jewish life at the time. And so um, I don't know, I mean, I don't, I don't think that was necessarily the beginning of their downfall, um, but I think it is an interesting question about you know, I mean, for example, I once went around to every table at the Carnegie and asked people what they, what they were eating, not what specific foods they were eating, but how they would describe just in general, the type of food that they were eating. And I was curious whether anybody in that room, and these were people from all over the world, you know, from all different countries, from all over the United States, whatever, would anyone actually use the word Jewish to describe what they were eating? And nobody did. They said, you know, what are you talking about? I'm eating deli, you know? They didn't see it as a Jewish place, just as, you know, there were studies that were done of Seinfeld when it was at its height in the 1990s. And, and uh, you know, people, people in other parts of the country outside New York described it not as a Jewish show, but simply as a New York show. You know, they saw these characters as these kind of oddball, you know, neurotic New York characters. They didn't necessarily see them as Jewish. Whereas if you ask Jews who are watching this show, they'd be like, of course, you know, like half these characters are, they're almost all Jewish. You know what I mean? It was like, it was perceived in different ways according to, uh, to the lens or to the audience that was viewing it. And so, you know, I think it's, it's sort of similar in an interesting way that, um, you know, it's, it's not like food has one particular valence, you know, it's like it has all different meanings to all different people. And one of the things that I've really tried to suggest and I used to teach a course on this at Dickinson on uh, a summer school course on food and food waste in the United States. And what I would always emphasize in that course is that, you know, food is, is, is not just what we eat, but the, the experience of eating at any rate, not just the food itself, but the experience of eating is not just what we eat, but it's where we eat, it's how we eat, it's when we eat, it's with whom we eat. You know, those things all really condition 
the, the eating experience. Like I have a quote in my book from Arthur Schwartz, who was a, a radio host in New York for a long time and is a cookbook author. Some of you might have his, uh, his cookbooks. And, um, and he said that, you know, I mean, he gave an example of uh, being on uh, vacation on, uh, you know, on the Amalfi coast of, of Italy or whatever, you know, and, and eating spaghetti with clam sauce. Um, <laughs> and he's, he's a Jewish, uh, he's a, you know, he's Jewish, but he doesn't keep kosher, obviously. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and he says, you know, the best spaghetti with clam sauce that you ever ate was, you know, when you're sitting on the coast of, of you know, of, of, of the Mediterranean and, um, and you're eating spaghetti with clam sauce with your lover, you know, whispering in your ear, like, it's, it's not the spaghetti with clam sauce. <laughs> <laughs> it almost doesn't matter what the quality of the spaghetti is, you know what I mean? It's all about the gestalt of the, of the experience. And, um, you know, and, and actually, I mean, maybe I'm over, again, maybe I'm overdoing all the sort of the, the sexual references, but, um, you know, food and sex are very similar in that, you know, we think of them as about sort of physical pleasure, but the, you know, the experience is much more about what's going on up here, you know, than, than down there, wherever, you know, <laughs> that's what it's about. <laughs> and, and so it's the same thing, you know, it's, you know, right. I mean, so, so to talk about food as it's just like, oh, it tastes good or it tastes bad or whatever, you know, is to miss out on so many of the aspects that actually make the experience of eating meaningful for us as, as, as human beings. And that's part of what I was trying to get at just a little bit in, in, in terms of writing this book on the deli. Ted, you did get to it and you got to it beautifully. And the, this talk was just, just a wonderful example of why you're such a great writer and such a great journalist and really such a great researcher and ethnographer. And I just thank you so much. And, uh, and I think we all really just thank you so much for being with us tonight. My pleasure. And I'm sorry I couldn't make it out to Oklahoma in person. I usually don't let such things as a global pandemic interrupt my, <laughs> my speaking uh, you know, schedule, but uh, you know, maybe someday it'll be, it'll be possible. We'll get you. We'll get you on the on the back end. I, I, I'm happy. We'd be very happy to hear about your first book too. I would love it. Any any time. Uh, All right. Good night, everyone. Have a happy Passover, Aziz and Pesach. Hag Pesach Sameach. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so 